Uh, I'm Guillermo Fons, uh, one of the founders of Nebula Studios. I'm, I, uh, I'm a director. And I'm Miguel Medeil Freitas, and I'm the lead 3D artist over at Nebula by eight years or so ago, and I'm also one of the directors of the short film. So we are um, a studio based in Lisbon, Portugal, and today we're going to be talking about how we started using Cinema 4D because we come from a different uh, 3D software. And we will focus on our uh, short film that is currently in production, which is Don't Feed These Animals. Um, Nebula Studios works mainly for advertising. We do a lot of commercials for brands and agencies. We animate, but also shoot, and sometimes we mix both worlds uh, with VFX and animation. So we started working with Cinema 4D about three years ago, and it's, it was like love at first sight. We really love it. And our first project was for Euro 2020. We, uh, we were, were asked to, to make the animation for the logo launch, um, which was presented last year, I think. And it was like a perfect project to, to start using cinema. Uh, it's really simple shapes and simple visuals, so it was perfect. Yeah, the, the, the trick was that everything had to be animated with tiny, tiny, very detailed animation of things just popping out, and uh, it would be something that would take a lot of time in other softwares, and it just, by using the MoGraph, it was just a piece of cake, fun thing to do. Yeah, and really also nice ultra, ultra fast rendering times. Oh yeah, yeah super fast. Seconds. So let's let us show the actual film. So, thank you. Yeah, well, first test. This was the, the first one we really enjoyed doing and we learned a lot. And after this, um, a juice brand called Umbongo uh, came to us and asked for a, a new animation with the new characters they had. And characters is, is like the, the main area that we are focused. We really want to, to animate characters. And this was the perfect uh, opportunity to to try the, the rigging tools from Cinema 4D and also to test um, the new this this visual which resembles like 2D illustration. We had 11 characters, four small characters which are the the sugars at the bottom, and it was really a true challenge because we had to to make all of this from scratch. It's a one minute animation. And all within three months span. And again, the, the, the principles of this job were not only have to rig and animate all these characters, but also keep the very tight 2D look uh, that it's almost like a, a, a brand uh, trademark. Uh, something that they have done and redone and 2D animation all over since the 80s. So it was some big pressure in, in concept-wise. And again, thinking, an old thinking of old, old software, this would be a nightmare. So let's try it out. Let's see what cinema can offer us to help us to achieve this in, in this timely, uh, tight deadline. It doesn't seem, to, doesn't seem to be, but it is. Three months is not that, uh, that much. No. So um, we had these broad guidelines, but we had to come up with a really cool designs for everything from, from the models of whatever made the, the Juice factory. Uh, and this one is the tower with a slide. But also, as I said, to, to keep a, a consistent 2D look while being everything on 3D. Um, and the tools that Cinema offers regarding cell shading and as well as a tune shader 
they are just mind blowing the way that you stack and stack layers upon layers of fine tuned control cell shading is just amazing and how fast this would render uh, there's there's also there's real hair grass in the in the in the bottom and it blended so well just by using just the shadow and the light contrast so you wouldn't have like harsh shadows it was really fun thing to accomplish and we were learning by the way we were doing it right and the same thing goes with rigging so the the tools in c4d for the the, the character builder uh, is really powerful enough it's simple and yet powerful so that you have a, a, a simple basis which everyone can just pick it up and start rigging but also gives you the, uh, the flexibility to to just go on and add or remove things that you would need or don't like the elephant's trunk or something like that that you would need to, to think about how to accomplish that so it's very robust system uh, you can have along some bendy bones, anything like that, that you would not uh, think it would be usual in other softwares, for instance. So really nice. And the way that you can take one rig and then almost duplicate to the other characters in very quickly, just adjust to your needs per character, it was yeah. quick. So We almost just had to tweak the, the rig and, and skin. Yeah. The, again, the same thing. Should I play it? Yeah. Regarding the facial animations, because almost every, all, all characters have facial animation, mm -hmm. even the small sugar ones. Um, they were all based on blend shapes and morphing, as you can see on the right. Um, the animators, most of the characters would just go on, go to the slides, and just have a hard time doing it. But the main ones, we, we made the special controls in the viewport in the HUD, so you could easily adjust the sliders and have some pretty fine expressions that you, the guys would make. So this is one of the, it's the final frame of the shot of the, the ad uh, with all the characters on, on set. Like, running all this were seconds. It's, it's amazing, man, come on. Non-realistic, it's like uh, mm. yesterday I heard this. Uh, it can be really fun because it's super fast to accomplish this. And some, some more of the, the final shots, final frames. So I think we did a good job in keeping the 2D style into it. And let me show you the final, the final movie. Boom, 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 Feito com 80% de fruta, 20% de água, sem adição de açúcares nem ingredientes artificiais, o novo Mbongo é outra história. Ok. Thanks. Thank you. So, we really enjoyed to make all these animations for brands, but we really want to, to create our own stories and, and our own animations with our own characters. So, we are normally always with new ideas for films and, and small sketches. And this time we mm, j just t took the, the leap of faith and started making our own shorts. Um, so this is a bit... Uh, yeah, uh, I remember like probably right in the first year that we, that we met to start working together, we started to think about, hey, would it be nice to, to make a short film? Something like that. So each year we try to make a, write a script, something that could eventually see the light of day, but we knew that it would be impossible to achieve that in such a small studio in Portugal, etc., etc. Uh, but the years go by and you think, come on, we should really try this. Otherwise we just die and never accomplish this. So mm. let's go, let's take that little bit of faith and let's see how can we make this. 
Yeah. So, and so, we are here today, so I think we are doing it. Like you said, uh, being a small studio, it's a bit difficult. We had some challenges. These were some of the, the major ones. And our short, it's long. It's uh, Don't Feed These Animals. And this is a bit of the story how we took those challenges and surpassed them. So challenge number one, to have a story to tell. Uh, it all started with this drawing, uh, which was made by José Alves da Silva. Um, he gave me this draw in a Christmas party. And when I saw it, uh, I immediately knew that we had to make something out of this guy. It was such a, a cute uh, little lobotomized bunny. And like me and Miguel are always watching the, the sketches from José Alves da Silva and always imagining stories. Mm -hmm. This one was like the first step. Let me show you some more yeah, with the same character. Yeah, José was... Uh, José made this, this character, uh, like a, this exercise, exercise, so he could practice drawing the same character in different points of views and still keep consistency. So he chose this rather simplistic form in shapes. Uh, so he just kept drawing and drawing. Every day he would draw this new uh, situation of, of Lobo. Um, and each time we saw a new drawing, we thought, hey man, come on, this, this has this little storytelling uh, within this, like the, the Darth Vader, you can almost imagine in figure like this small gag. Um, but they were just that, they were not complete stories, they could not be told in a, in a short film. So, but still, the days went by and José eventually started depicting um, some more of the basic essence of what rabbits like to do, which is eating carrots. So, so we started, okay, I think there's something we could explore as a story. Why not? Let's let's try to pick that that basic feeling, which is hunger, and the action that it leads to, which is feeding, and mix it up with this crazy low bottomized bunny, who doesn't have a, like this rational thinking process. And let's see what 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 it comes from there. So I think there's something there to explore. Um, so basically, I, I, the, the storyline is pretty simple. This is all set in the the mad scientist lab in which Lobo, the, the lobotomized bunny, lives in. And one day, he, he noticed this carrot that falls in the, in the ground, and it goes, bam, completely bananas with it. It goes Tasmanian devil style and, and tries to eat it. Eventually, he gives life to it uh, with this larger lay ray, uh, laser ray machine. Uh, and what happens next is this rather crazy series of events. Uh, all driven by his reckless behavior and appetite. Eventually, you'll find himself in, in this life-threatening situation where we, he, will get to, he will have to overcome that feeling in order to survive. So uh, we try to, to have all these condensed that could be entertained for eight minutes long to have not only action thing, scenes, but also decisions and emotions, something more deep. If you, can, if you can call it way. And the, the, the storytelling, uh, the story, the, the writing of the story mm -hmm. was a, um, a very nice process between both of us and not only us. So some more people had this and that to, to say. Um, but it was like, I would say, give an idea, start an idea, we would just finish it. So we went back and forth along and until to the point this is close, it's awesome, we're very fond of this, this story we have to tell. So challenge number one done, Yeah. And challenge number two. Yeah, after that we had to, to get the perfect team. Uh, we at Nablo have a very strong core team, but it, it's too small for a project like this, so we knew that we had to, to scout for some more artists, and we went f all over the world to pick them up, and we had guys from Brazil, from Thailand, from uh, the United States also. And it, it was like a true challenge to, to keep our vision aligned with them. So we had to create some uh, strategies to, to share our vision. So we did a lot of sketches and layouts uh, like these ones. We also did um, <laughs> shooting references. Uh, just to to show how we wanted to to make the the animation, 
we pretty much can make all the, the film with, the, with those references of Miguel. Uh, it's, getting, it's getting bad, this yeah. joke. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was it for the, the team? No, the, main, the main thing, with, by doing all these, these videos, of course, I don't really enjoy, and right now I don't really enjoy seeing myself there. <laughs> but that's the, the main reason, of course, because in, in our mind it's perfectly, it's crystal clear our idea that we want like as a basis in the shot, so like uh, the logo is really oh my god it's such a cute carrot and the end goes ah, <laughs> but it but really helps. But sometimes uh, the animators would not simply share our vision or see it so clearly. So if of course it's much easier to have this read video reference. Everyone did it, not only me. Most of there's where you we could I have a, a a live real life action short. Then we do all this. Yeah, but let's let's yeah. let's continue. Okay. Then uh, to have supporters, we knew that uh, such a massive, uh, at least for us, project like this, we really really need to to have some help, um, and we reached out to Maxon, and right from the beginning they they left the story, they left the project, and with them some more uh, brands came along. And we really had the, the pleasure of having uh, Maxon, Redshift, and Vide, Wacom, and also Grid Markets with, with Render Farm and Orion VM with the, the horsepower to, to render the, the short. So we were really grateful. And we decided to make last year some Christmas promos to, to not only promote the, the short, but also to to say thanks for the, the help we, yes. we get from the, yes. the brands. Yes. So this was also like the first test, right? With this, we really uh, tested the, the rendering, the animations, the compositing also, and we, we saw that it was working. It, we, it was getting the look that we wanted. So it, it was fun because we tried to, to have one single piece that divided by a smaller pieces. It would work for each brand to, to to show in their social mm. media and stuff like that, so it, it was a cool way to say thank you so much to everyone involved, and these were the first promos. So yeah, Good. everyone liked it. Um. Yeah, and in parallel, we are we're also producing um, production diaries, uh, which they pretty much uh, resume and uh, try to to show a little bit more of, of the production and the behind the scenes. They are on our Vimeo and also at our website. Each one talks. Um, there's one for uh, sound design, there's one for animation, there's one for uh, concept. So each one has a specific part of the pipeline. Yeah, it was, it was a cool idea just also to share the process to e for everyone to, to be able to see what we are doing. So basically, supporters, it's check. So I think we're good to go and make the movie. And let's see a little bit step by step uh, the process of making a short film like we are making. Uh, so uh, the Christmas promos, of course, of course, they were already in mid-production, so we, we were able to test uh, some of the technical difficulties that we might expect sooner or later, like the fur and the rendering, everything like that. Um, so let's see, take it a little step back and see it from the beginning. 
So this was the very, very first concept that we ever did. Um, it was me. I have no idea I could paint at all, if this is a color painting. <laughs> It's a funny story because I had to I had to redo this because I didn't save and the light went out. So I just oh my god, what about now? Untitled project. I'll, I'll just do it, try it again. So let's go untitled project. So first stone ever thrown, and eventually some some of our uh, artists started begin be, uh, sketching uh, some rough ideas for for the main architectural um, layouts of of the the basement of the lab. Um, Basically, it was divided in these four areas: the, the lab, the, the cage of the animals, uh, the pantry, and then the surgery room. Let's see each one. So the main lab should have all these crazy gadgets. There's the giant golden fish, which is also a result of an experiment. Some more gadgets all over. Um, here at the right, you can see it was the very first the very first concept of the laser ray machine that you'll see it completely different by, by the end. So this was very broad ideas. Uh, the animal cave, which also changed a lot, where all the animals should be kept and where Lobo lives most of his time. Then the pantry, where the food is kept and, and prepared. So a lot of, a lot of stuff, basically. Uh, we tried to throw in so, some, some of uh, the household you would expect, like even though he's this mad scientist, he still ha has a laundry machine and <laughs> small things like that to keep him human. And then the surgery room where all the cut and stuff like that just happened. <laughs> so uh, as regarding to the storyboard process, we, we decided to go as quick as possible, not go to a super detailed storyboard as you would expect um, just we just really wanted to have a feeling of timing and action so we went on t for a, mo a more visual layout of each set of each act that we decided in the story um, so the lighting would act as well as a storytelling uh, element so we did this contrast visual tones and at the same time, everyone started to work on here and that. Some people started to model props, some start, people started to model characters. And this was one of the first characters ever modeled, which is a, a mechanical fly. And she has, as you can see, she, she, she has a, a pedal system that you need to just pedal to make the wings flap. And so she can fly. She gets very tired after some point. <laughs> Very mean experiment. So here's the, the final model of Marty, still in his white suit. Some of the details that Marty has in, in terms of modeling, um, all the system of the gears and stuff like that were, used, were made using simple cloners along with splines very quickly to achieve the same result. It, it all, all works very well when you animate them, of course, and also for the texturing, it was very easy. Um, so a lot of de fine details, even though they're not there, we had uh, such an amazing time in doing the, all this. And here's a, a final um, pre-render test of Marty doing his job, trying to keep alive in the air. Yeah, we, we, had, uh, we have our fingerprints mm -hmm. in the wings. Yeah, you probably can't see here, but yeah, we just fingerprint each wing. So then there's the main char characters, the, the Lobo, the bunny, and the, and the baby carrot. Um, for, the, for the carrots, when, when, the model, the, when the model showed us these first, uh, uh, first models um, with the hair that you usually expect in carrots, we thought, eh, let's, let's try a different thing. The hair is really simple. It doesn't look like a baby, it's something fresh. So let's, let's, do, let's push it some more. And in the end, the, the final model looks like this. Um, just a comparison from the standard carrot and after she gets alive, the baby carrot with a more dense hair, much beautiful and, and fresh. As for Lobo, again, very simple forms, which were then covered by, by fur. Uh, of course, the, the, the significant characteristics of Lobo are his knobs, metal knobs, because he was brain cut, he's lobotomized, and he has this 
big red eyes which go from black to red depending on his state of mind. And here's this, both of them just happily like they're best friends. So at the same time, guys over at the chairs modeling props and sets. And um, they did a good job in trying to keep the consistency between the, the concepts to the final models. Um, we had a huge use of uh, C4D's tools, not only to model, but also for the scene management, because everything exists in one single set, the master set, which, which was a huge file. And uh, it was, uh, we had to, to have good, proper tools to keep the house tidy. The pantry, hundreds and hundreds of objects over there, using cloners, for instance, to very quickly achieve random in, randomization in scales and colors and shapes, rotations. The animal cave and its concept. And the main lab area, uh, which in the end it's, has a lot more objects than this. Some of the props that we built, mechanical, uh, medical gear, all crazy gadgets for crazy experiments, and a lot of surgery equipment all over as well. And as I said before, we have a laser ray machine. You saw, you saw in, in the concept, but this was the final concept and final model. We decided we wanted to, to have it resemble like a, a movie camera. And, and something very important, it would be something, you wouldn't buy this like in, in Ikea or something like that. You, it, it was something that the mad science, scientist had to build himself. So with what? With every kind of household materials, lamps, sewing machines, turntables for the records, you name it. Anything that you keep, pick up, let's go. <laughs> I can build this. Some renders. And um, eventually got to the part of the rigging and setups, which was, of course, tricky, but very fun to do because we had not only standard rigging systems with the squash and stretch uh, setups, we made this kind of layout uh, for the, the fashion animation. Some tests with the, the squash and stress systems, but that it's, like I said before, it's so powerful that C4D has right off the shelf systems like this, which, is, which are usually hard to accomplish with other, with other softwares. And we also, did a uh, very good use of the Expresso, is it, what? yeah, it's playing, of the Expresso uh, tools. Uh, this is a very simple case where in order to change Lobo's eyes from black to red, which happens all, all the time, uh, rather than the animator has to change his pupil size, the color of the eyes, the brightness, everything like that, it would just change this slider so everything works accordingly. Um, as you can see, it changes in very quickly. We were using Redshift, and at the time we were building the system, we could actually have it real time to see how it affects if everything is working, the change of the, the brightness and the color of the eyes. Having this kind of feedback was, was amazing to just mm -hmm. speed things up. Some more cool stuff that we, we did with the C4D tools, like, for instance, there's this shot where the, where the giant goldfish just looks at Marty, which is standing on the glass of the, the, the aquarium, just comes over and bam, it, it crashes against the wall. <laughs> it goes like, like this. So we, it was funny because we had the idea, hey, can, 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 you, can we like squash him, squash him against the wall and like keep, it, keep him completely flat? Uh, we're just using deformers, is it this possible? And yes, it, it is, and it is, and it, it was quite powerful. Let's see what it happens to the little guy, it just get, gets completely flattened. Bam, <laughs> looks like a, a sliced fish. And, and uh, we thought, yeah, that's cool, but probably it's gonna be a, a rendering nightmare because of all the overlapping faces, but it doesn't. It never overlaps any face. face. So it worked pretty well at, mm -hmm. right from the beginning. Uh, so the fish, since this is a secondary uh, character, we shouldn't like waste all the time rigging this. So we, we basically came up with some noise, animated noise for all the fins and stuff like that. So we basically would need to, to move him from A to B and just open his mouth. 
or the ice. So very quickly to, to make this. And still on the automatic setups and, and more precisely, more mechanical way of set up and setting up something, like the laser machine, it has, I don't know, but I think it's approximately 500 pieces there. And they're almost all interconnecting mechanically with each other. So for instance, to, to shoot the ray, you would really need to push the pedal, which pushes the lever, blah, 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 starts the machine, makes the, the film rotate, rotating, and it shoots. And the animators looked at it and like, come on, guys, are you crazy? Do you want me to spend two years animating this? No. Just have to move the machine, hit the sliders, and just use the target where you want to, to shoot and to point and shoot. So, oh, cool, that's, that's nice. And what about shaking the whole mach machine? Is it possible? Yeah, just have a slider. Just push the magic button. <laughs> but no, we, we had to create um, some very complex espresso systems. They're, they're probably not very complex, but they are, they are big. Uh, but it was so powerful. Here it is, the, the espresso system for, for the machine. So, yeah. It seems cumbersome, but in the end, it makes sense for the guy. And also for Marty. So how does it work? He has this regular IK or FK system in the legs. It works when he, when he, and when he walks. But soon as he puts his, pedal, his, his feet in, in the pedals, you just have to animate the slider over there, how fast you want Marty to flap his wings. And everything works mechanically. He rotates the pedal, and, and the wings flap. Yeah, practice. <laughs> so um, while everything was happening at all over, uh, I started to develop the, the fur. And uh, I, I didn't have any experience in C4D at all. Like, so fur was uh, my first time. And, and from my experience, it could be a really pain. Um, and it, it turns out that fur in each software, it's very fun until rendering. That's true. That's a universal truth. But still, the way until there, it was very funny to accomplish C4D because the tools in it are just so powerful. Like, you can stack everything that you want, like the thickness. I mean, every single property is stackable, is animatable, is mappable. So it's easy to, to get to a point where you fine tune and have the creative decisions in it. However, no, this is, these are just some first experiments that I was trying to, to go from and test it out. I, I realized that I, I should divide the, the hair uh, in smaller portions, like from the snout, from the ears, and stuff like that, just to keep it um, easier to work with. However, like the main body, just the, the, the legs and arms, probably just the main body has a, like five min, million hairs. It's like crazy. So I had this problem, which was, if I have to like define the way it's going to look, I have to render it. And, and every time I need to render something, it's going to at least take me five, 10 minutes just to process the math of the hair until I see something. And then I, just, I don't like it, and I have to redo all this, and I can spend the whole day without going anywhere. So I need to have a way to quickly visualize the end result of the hair without having five million hairs all the time. And this was like, it doesn't, it doesn't happen that way. You can't. Every time you try either to apply the, the, the same visual to a smaller patch, it changes the overall look. Or if you just lower the density of the hairs, it changes the overall look. It, so it doesn't really work. So after some months, and after I tried out Expresso and little, this little bit, I realized I could achieve this. I could, I could basically just define a, a percentage of polygons without changing the hairs it would effect effectively just process 10% of the hairs without changing the overall look. So at this point, I really, think, I really thought, OK, this is going to be really fun and fast because it's now five minutes to process it, five seconds. So in a, one hour, I could do the same work in one day. Do you want to talk about this? I'm a little mm -hmm. bit thirsty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sure. Sorry. So um, the animation. Um, the animation is really the, the art of making mistakes. And we did a lot of passes. Here you can see 
uh, going from a, like a blocking stage until the almost final uh, animation. Those are from the the reference we showed earlier from Miguel waving his arm. We used it as reference for this. Yeah, uh, the the thing that we reali realized in animation, and you can see that almost in every interaction there's a slight change on his action. Sometimes he waves like this, sometimes he waves both arms, and and this was where we said we need to make mistakes. Don't don't be afraid of going crazy. And each time you do some animation, just be quick in blocking stuff mm -hmm. out. Don't waste three days in fine-tuned animation in fingers. No, let's keep it really broad and test. Make mistakes because it's probably somewhere in the middle that beautiful um, outcomes are going to, are going to be uh, are going to happen. Yeah, and sometimes some solutions some, even yeah. from from mm -hmm. things that we Think don't really know how to do, right? I, I, I'm not a uh, lobotomized bunny. Mm. I, I don't know how to act. So basically, this was a refining process of all that. And as regarding for texturing and shading, um, we had thousands of objects, small objects, and we simply couldn't go and unwrap every sing, single object. Uh, so it was much faster than one could think of because we, on, we only unwrapped the main characters and some very specific main props. So everything else was, was done with simple mappings and then we came up, came up with a, a, a shading network in Redshift that was almost completely procedural. And how we did this was we, we used Substance Painter to, to paint all the main maps for the characters. Uh, and just extract the, the diffuse maps, the, the roughness, and stuff like that that you usually do. And for everything else, we, we thought of the mediums that we needed to have, like woods, stones, any kind of medium, uh, metals, and we basically had smaller uh, tileable textures, very simple ones that we could then simply use and mix between, them, be, between each other to, to get all kind of random uh, results. We also did some, with, just by using the same system, some grunge maps, some dirt maps, all kinds of uh, random maps and masks that you could then use. So then by getting all these into Redshift shader, what we did was, in the end, uh, if you pick these, there are three medium materials. There are glasses, plastics, and metals. And if you extend this list to like 5,000 of these objects, and still with, the, with one single click, every single one would look different. And we, the variable here was the display color in the viewport, which Redshift was getting as a variable of, in C4D's own display color, and changed the roughness, the diffuse. Even we used triplanar tri mapping in almost all of these shading networks, so even the mapping was changing, so there is no repetition. So it was really, really powerful and, of course, fast to accomplish the, 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 the shading. It was just, are these metals? Done. Are these glasses? Done. So then on from for, for lighting and final rendering. So again, the use of Redshift was re really crucial uh, when they came aboard and, and helped us. Um, we were just amazed how fast it is to use GPU render. Uh, and specifically Redshift is so powerful, it has so many features in itself that, for instance, here I was working on the, this look dev of the, this machine, and, and I said, I'm going to go crazy, I'm just going to turn on the volumetric lighting, it's so cool to see it and I can see it real time, so why not? It gives me a, an extra, I, I don't know, an extra mm -hmm. wow factor mm -hmm. rather than anything else. So it was really important to have this kind of speed and power to, to see. Like, this machine is just one material, complete material. I think, too, because of the, some of the glasses that are there. So everything is just one material. No, absolutely no unwrapping in, in this machine. Very fast to do. So uh, at the same point, we, we realized, OK, this render is just awesome. Um, and let's try it out and, and test it out in the, in the final rendering, and uh, let's try to keep compositing probably to a minimum instead of having thousands of passes because we have like almost 200 shots in the whole film. 
uh, let's try to keep it to a bare minimum and try to get almost all the, the quality in the beauty pass. So pretty much these are the, the render passes. It's just the beauty. Some IDs just to be able to fine tune anything if you need, just like a, a fail safe mm. uh, rather than a, a creative decision. Some ambient occlusion if needed. And the ZDEF as well, because we almost all shot, we rendered out with the real camera motion blur and real depth of field anytime we were possible by render times limitations. And let me show you like a, a, a little bit of the, the process to set up the shot. So like for instance, this, is, this was the final animated shot. And from, from here, um, we made extensive use of the tech system of C4D. Um, so we, we were able to very quickly get this file with all some of the predefined tags that are like common, uh, get you 60% done uh, of the needed tags per shot. Um, so, and basically I've, I've defined the lower area where you can see the tags, they are defined basically by the set, uh, the characters that can have either the carrot, the lobo, the machine, but basically these are the tags. And then per take, I, I, I put the, the, the render, the final render here. It's not the render in the viewport, but it could be if you render obviously in the viewport, but just so you can see the result of each take. So for instance, in the set, we have, um, we have all the characters down in the, the middle red arrow. There's this redshift tag where you can then in the upper arrow, you can say it's, it's renderable, but it's not visible in the, in the camera. So you get all the shadows and all the bouncing lights that the GI would make, uh, some reflections if you have reflections on the set. So they are there, but they are not visible in the camera. So the main set would be like this, just straight out and render. So then you would go, OK, let's go for the carrot tag, for instance. And the carrot tag goes from the same principles. But this time, the set is there, but it's just being rendered as a mat. So you, you get all the lighting interactions with the, the set, but it's so much quicker to render, and you still have the, the perfect alpha, so you can composite better if you want to. Um, the same goes for Lobo. As you can see, the volumetric lighting is there, uh, along with fur. Uh, Lobo renders, yeah, they, they, could, go, they could go to pretty, pretty mm. high uh, render time, especially like um, so you can have an idea. In the end, let, let me just continue. So basically the same thing. All the set is a mat. It's there, but it's not showing in the camera. Just the main carrot. This was super quick when I found out that I could use the take system and import the takes from another, another scene. I had no idea. <laughs> so I was doing all these changes one by one, and th there could be hundreds of changes on, in all shots. So, uh, shit, if I knew this a year ago. And then for the machine, same principle. Hide everything else. I mean, the, the characters are there. They are not visible, but they are, they are showing up in the, in the reflections. You can see the reflection of the carrots, like in the middle of the glass in the lens. There's, a, there's this little speck of orange. It's a carrot. And here is the final, it's not the, f the final shot in terms of grading, but everything comes and it looks like this. So no composition, this is straight up from, this is just a beauty pass. Like for instance, these shots here, these frames can take three hours per frame on a dual 1080 Ti, easily. It was like, oh, <laughs> okay, it's gonna be fun. And it goes exponential, the fur. Like in the back, mm -hmm. 20 minutes, and then three hours. Oh my god. And there are a lot of close-ups. And here are some of the, um, the, final, the final shots of the film. Um, so a lot of stuff, as you can see. Since there's a lot of light, yeah, you can't really dark. see too much. I'm sorry. I hope you, you, then you will be interested in seeing the final result in your home. And Marty flying. Uh, some of the details, like in all the machines, everything is procedural, like, like what they... Super quick to apply. 
some shots of Lobo going all crazy, trying to give life to the, to the carrot. Uh, this is precisely the transformation where the carrot goes from a simple one to a live one. It's a funny, very funny thing. The little guys over here in this chase. So lighting was a real big deal to us. We, if there's no good lighting, there's nothing. Another final, sh final frame, and and this is it. Basically, we, we are we are almost finishing the film. We are rendering these long-lasting renders. It's harder than we thought, but much more, <laughs> much harder than we thought it would be. Of course, there's no experience experience that can tell you how long it's going to take to do this. There's nothing to tell. And I hope you've enjoyed our long story short, don't feed these animals. Um, here's the, the, the trailer uh, we are showing. We showed it, premiered it yesterday. And here it is again for you to see. I hope you enjoyed it. Let's go. was a trailer. Thank you. Thank you. So I hope you've enjoyed this small presentation. Um, if you want to check this out and follow us, uh, if you have any questions, we, we are here. We'll be here, so let us know. Thank you so much. And a huge thanks to Max and everyone else involved. Without them, this wouldn't be possible at all. <laughs>